In the previous video, we saw how different memory technologies need to be traded off in terms of the cost versus the storage capacity. This ultimately leads to the concept of a cache. And in this video, we are going to look at what caches are and how they can be used in order to improve the performance of a computer. So the first thing we can ask is, what exactly is a cache? And a good way to start is by looking up a dictionary definition. One possible dictionary definition, at least from the Webster's New World Dictionary of the American Language, is a safe place for hiding or storing things. And that actually matches quite well with the sense in which we plan to use the term. Nowadays, if you look up a dictionary, you'll actually find the word cache defined in the context of computers itself, because this word has now become so common. So what exactly are we talking about here? We have a large external memory. This could be DRAM, which could be in the gigabytes range, non-volatile RAM, which could be solid state. It could be an external disk, which could actually run into terabytes, so perhaps even more. We want to access this and bring this data into the CPU. And for this, since we know that the large external memories have high latencies, we would like to have a small, fast memory, which acts as a copy of this external memory. Now, why exactly do we expect this to work? And this comes down to something that goes by the name locality of reference. The concept of locality of reference is intuitively appealing. What it basically says is that if you are accessing a given location in memory, you are also likely to want to access other locations close to that. Now, why exactly does this happen? Imagine that you were caching part of a program, the instructions of a program that need to be executed. It becomes obvious why you have locality of reference, because after all, the way instructions are generated for a program is that you typically have successive instructions, one after the other. So after you have accessed address location number zero, you would then go to the next address location for assuming it's a 32-bit word and then eight and 12 and so on. Of course, if you have a branch, you do not follow this locality of reference. But the point over here is that branches typically constitute a relatively small percentage of the instructions in a program. Once you have completed the branch, the successive instructions after that are going to be once again local to the one the place where you started. There are two ways of looking at this concept of locality of reference. One of them, spatial locality, is what happens when we look at program instructions or array memory locations. In other words, if you have, uh, if you have accessed a given memory location, chances are that you would then want to access nearby memory locations in the near future. Temporal locality is slightly different. What it says is, if you accessed a given memory location at a given point in time, there is a chance you might want to access the same memory location once again in the near future. This too happens very often, especially when we are talking about arrays or some kind of data structures that are being constantly updated. Perhaps some computations are being done where we read the value of the location, perform some computations, and then update it once again. Either way, both of these forms of locality of reference encourage us to look at the idea of having a small cache of memory, which is capable of storing the data corresponding to the computations that we are performing, so that we do not need to keep going back to the high latency external memory every time we want to access a given data structure. All this works on something called the principle of prediction. We are trying to predict what the future behavior of the processor is likely to be. That is to say, is the processor going to request certain other memory locations or memory addresses that are close or are the same as the one that we have already accessed recently. Of course, the question becomes, how do we do this mapping? In practice, we typically have a large actual address space. And this address space, while it may not be fully occupied by physical memory, could still be very large. We may be talking about gigabytes or even more of memory. And as we have seen, the static RAM, which is the fastest in terms of access, is also quite expensive, 
and it's very unlikely that we would be able to use gigabytes of it in normal commodity equipment. Therefore, typical caches are on the sizes of kilobytes or at most perhaps megabytes. The idea is that we reuse the same locations in the cache for multiple locations in the main memory. In other words, large parts of the main memory are mapped into the same parts of the cache. This, of course, means that there is a chance of collisions. We might be using some data present in the cache, but another request for data might also collide with the same location and might say it also wants to be stored in the same location in cache. We have options on what to do then. One of them could be that we evict or remove the old data present in the cache and bring in new data to fill in the cache. This means that we also need to have some identifier to indicate which data is actually present in the cache. And this identifier is typically called the tag. It would be part of the address that is actually used in order to access a given memory location. On top of all this, we would also need to have some way of indicating whether the data present in the cache actually corresponds to valid data or was just something that corresponded to the system being switched on. Because after all, the first time we switch on a processor, we do not have any data in the cache. As and when data is being read, we need to pull the data into the cache and then update some entry to indicate that, yes, this is now valid data. And as and when new data comes in, we might need to invalidate it. One way by which we could do the mapping of a large external memory into a cache is shown in this figure here. It's something called a direct mapped cache. And the formula that is used for a direct mapped cache could be as simple as the formula shown on the right, which is if you have an address x, then the address to which it is mapped is basically x modulo 8. Now, why 8? Because our cache is assumed to have 8 entries, whereas the memory block itself could have many more than eight entries. As you can see over here, what this means is that several of the blocks in the main memory, the ones marked in blue, for example, all map onto cache location number 101, while all the blocks marked in gray in the main memory get mapped onto cache location 001. What we have done is basically taken the bottom three bits of the address in the main memory and use that to indicate which part of the cache it goes into. Now, if you think about it, you could have used any other part of the address as well, but it's probably not a good idea. In particular, let's say that we choose the top three bits of the address in order to indicate which location in the cache it is going to. That in some ways actually defeats the whole purpose of our locality of reference, because what it would mean is that all the entries at the top corresponding to 000 at the top would then get mapped into the same location in the cache. And our presumption that by having one of them, we would then be accessing the next few would actually backfire because having accessed the first one, then I want to go to the next one, I would need to throw out the first one and then pull in the next one into the same location. This is why caches typically use a modular computation meaning that the bottom bits are used in order to distribute the data into the cache. Let's consider a sequence of reads into this eight element cache. The initial state of the cache after power on is shown over here. The index values on the left are essentially addresses into the cache, but keep in mind that the cache is something which is internal to the processor. In particular, it is never really seen directly by the programmers so you cannot, for example, try and read from a given location in the cache. You cannot force the CPU to read from a given location in the cache and tell you what is there. The V column essentially corresponds to the valid bit. It starts off with all the values being invalid or marked N. The tag would indicate the higher part of the address to indicate which is the actual address that is being stored at this particular index. And finally, the data would have the data itself that is being stored over there. So let's see what happens when we go through a sequence of read operations corresponding to this cache structure. The first read, let's say, is from address location 10110, binary. Since the bottom bits are 110, 
it goes into index location number 110, which is now marked valid. And the tag 10 essentially corresponds to the higher order bits of the address. The data is whatever memory was present at this address location. Now, the next read perhaps is from address location 11010. As we can see, 010 corresponds to a different index location and ends up going into that. The entry over there was invalid and therefore we can put the new data over there without having any problems. Now, as you would note, the terminology that is used is to say that we had a miss of this address 11010. What that means is, the first thing the CPU does when it gets a read request to this address 11010 is to check the cache to see whether the data is already present there and is valid. If it is not, that's called a cache miss. What happens then is that the cache controller, the memory controller then goes out, fetches the data from the main memory, brings it into the cache and then delivers it to the CPU. We continue and if we have a read from address location 10000, it now goes into index location 000 with a corresponding tag put into the tag location of that entry. Next we have 00011, once again it goes into a different location and at this point you'll notice that we are now reading 10010. As you can see from the previous picture, here we had 11010 already present in memory location 010. So when we try to read from the 10010, they are both colliding as far as the index value is concerned. What we do is therefore replace the old entry with the new entry. We update the tag entry to 10 instead of the 11 that it was earlier and replace the memory with the content memory of 10010. So in this way, we had a sequence of reads where one of the reads resulted in a collision which required one particular entry from the cache to be evicted and a new value to be brought in. This essentially summarizes the same read sequence. We have the decimal address of the reference and the binary addresses. So far, we were looking at the binary addresses. As you can see, the different cache blocks that have been assigned for each of these address locations shows us that address location 26 and 18 are the ones that end up colliding. Initially, we read 26, pulled that into the cache, but when address location 18 came along, we had to evict the data corresponding to 26 and then put that new entry in there. In between, of course, what we have is that the fact that 26 was read more than once, or 22 was read more than once, or 16 indeed was read three times, is what makes the cache successful. As a result of those entries, we actually have multiple cache hits, in addition to, of course, the cache misses. In general, when you're operating this on a large system, one of the things that you will notice is that as soon as the system is powered on, the cache is of course empty. And one of the things that you would need to do is to start pulling data into the cache. This is sometimes also called warming up the cache. Getting, in other words, the first time that you execute a part of a program, a large number of instructions get read into the instruction cache and similarly data may get read into the data cache. In subsequent executions, we might find that the performance is actually better than the first time around that it runs. Now let's try and estimate the storage requirement for a cache memory. Assume that we have 1024 cache locations, which essentially corresponds to a 10 bit index, and we are storing one word or 32 bits per location, which means at the bottom two bits of the address, assuming that we are talking about a byte addressable memory, are not required to be used for the cache. The next 10 bits above that, 11 colon 2, will be used for the index, and the remaining 52 bits, 63 down to 12, will be used for the tag itself. 
what needs to be stored inside the cache is a valid bit, one bit, 52 bits corresponding to the tag, because after all, any time that we get the index value, we need to go and look at the tag to see whether it actually corresponds to the address we are currently looking at. And of course, the 32 bits of the data itself. This means that the amount of storage that we need over here is 1024 locations into 1 plus 52 plus 32 or 87 kilobits, which corresponds to around 10.1 kilobytes. Notice that the actual storage capacity of the cache is only 4 kilobytes and the memory that we are using is 10.1 kilobytes. This does not seem to be particularly efficient. One thing we could do is to use larger blocks. As an example, consider that we have a 16 kilobyte cache with once again 64 bit addresses, but now we use four word blocks. What that means is that each cache location is going to store 32 times four or 128 bits. The index remains the same as before 10 bits. Since we have 32 bit words, we omit the bottom two bits of the address. And since we are storing a block of four bits, four words, we are going to omit the next two bits of the address as well, which means that the tag width has come down to 50. Not much less than the 52 that we had earlier, but the data has now gone up from 32 bits to 128 bits. Therefore, one line of the cache stores 128 bits of data. And on top of that, it also needs 50 bits for the tag and one bit for valid leading to a total of 179. Since we have 1024 locations, this essentially corresponds to 179 kilobits or 22.4 kilobytes. Given the fact that we are actually storing 16 kilobytes of data in the cache, the 22.4 kilobytes over here is at least much more efficient than the 10.1 that we required for storing four kilobytes of cache. This is yet another reason for using larger block sizes that are stored at each cache location. Now, what we have discussed so far is what's called a direct mapped cache. The problem with the direct mapped cache is that each index value is determined purely by the bottom bits of the address that we are considering, which means that if I try to access two separate memory locations that have the same bottom bits, they would end up colliding on the memory even if the rest of the cache is empty. One way to handle that would be to say that perhaps we could have something called a fully associative cache. In an associative cache, what we say is, the data can get stored anywhere in the cache. All that I need to do is also store the tag itself. The problem with this approach is that, how do I find out where a tag is in the cache memory? In the case of a direct mapped cache, I know exactly where to expect the tag, and there is only one place where I need to look. In a fully associative cache, the tag could be anywhere in one of the locations in the cache, and I would actually need to do something which is called a content addressable memory in order to find out whether or not the tag is actually present. This is similar to the hash data structure that you may come across in a data structures and algorithms course. The point over here is that it is very expensive to implement in hardware. So what is often done is some kind of a trade-off between the two. We have some kind of set associativity. What we do is we say that we will first take the bottom k bits of the address, but rather than mapping that to a specific location in the cache, we will map it to a set of locations. As you can see in the picture over here, there are four sets that have been created. Set number zero, corresponds to the tag location, which is zero. Now there are two entries in that set, which means that either one of those tag entries could be checked. Let's say that one of the locations is already full. The cache controller would automatically take care of putting it into the other memory location. This helps us to get some kind of a trade-off between the absolute flexibility given by the fully associative cache and the ease of hardware implementation given by the direct mapped cache. Now, in terms of implementing all of this in hardware, one of the things that we need to understand is how do we actually handle cache misses? And as you can imagine, the main thing that needs to be done is, of course, 
stall the processor. You could think of this as just implementing any time of kind of a multi-cycle system, but there has to be some separate controller whose job is to keep track of when a data or instruction has been received, look at the address that is being accessed, freeze the CPU if necessary. That is to say, if the data is not present in the cache memory, the CPU has to be stalled or frozen until the data can actually be pulled in from external memory, put into the appropriate location, and then we restart the CPU at the correct address. The discussions that were seen in earlier videos about stalling and flushing pipelines are relevant over here. Essentially, similar kinds of behavior are what is required, and the way that it is implemented is also broadly similar. Of course, the devil is in the details. How exactly you implement it is not something trivial to do. So far, we have discussed primarily reading from a cache, but writing the data into a cache is also an important aspect of how the cache is implemented. Once again, there are two ways of looking at it. One is called a write through cache, where what we do is anytime you write data into a cache, that data is copied all the way back to main memory. Now, this is of course the safest way of doing it. What it means is that the data in the cache is more or less irrelevant, even if for some reason the cache does not work, we will actually have the data correctly sitting in the main memory. However, it can cause us to stall unnecessarily. We might, for example, have a situation where we are trying to write many values into some memory locations, but only the last value really matters to us. In such a case, a write back cache makes more sense. What we would do is keep the data in the cache and only when the cache entry is being evicted at some point, either perhaps because the program is over or we have moved out of this particular area of computation and we no longer, and we actually need to bring in something new. At that point, we will write the data back into the main memory. Now let's take a numerical example to try and understand what happens in the presence of caches and in particular, how we can model the impact that it has on a CPU's performance. Consider a processor that has a CPI or the number of cycles per instruction equal to two without any memory stalls. What this means is that assuming an ideal memory where we did not have any kind of cache misses, every instruction would take two clock cycles. But now consider a situation where we actually have a cache and 2% of instruction fetches are cache misses. This does not look like a lot. It basically tells us that if you have, let's say a thousand instructions, 2% or 20 times we are likely to miss in the cache. That's a fairly small number, but as you can see, it can actually have a big impact on performance. Similarly, let's assume that 4% of the loads and stores are cache misses. The problem here is that anytime we miss in the cache, we undergo a penalty of 100 clock cycles. The way to look at this would be, we missed the cache, the cache controller has to stall the CPU. It has to then go and fetch data from external memory, which is probably DRAM, which could take something like 100 clock cycles to respond. So the penalty of each time that we miss in the cache, we end up losing 100 clock cycles. On top of this, we also consider a situation where 36% of our total instructions are loads and stores. How do we go about analyzing such a system? As we can see, the CPI equal to two is our ideal situation. So our ideal processor that does not have any cache misses would have CPI equal to two. But since we know that 2% of instruction fetches are cache misses, let's assume that the total number of instructions is equal to X. What we are saying is that 0.02 X cache misses occur during the program. How many cycles are taken for that? times 100 or 2x cycles to handle 
cache misses for instructions. Now, out of the X instructions, how many are load store? 0.36 X, 36%. Out of that, 4% are misses. And each of those is going to undergo a penalty of 100 clock cycles. So the total number of clock cycles that are lost to data cache misses is 0.36 into 0.04 into 100x or 1.44x cycles to handle cache misses for data that is loads and stores. Now, the original processor would have taken, since it had X instructions, 2X cycles for execution alone. When we put everything together, what we find is 2X cycles for the execution, 2X for instruction misses, and 1.44x for data misses means 5.44x clock cycles are required for executing the program on this processor. So the slowdown is effectively by a factor of 5.44x divided by 2x or 2.7 times slower. This tells you the impact of what a cache can do. The problem of course over here was that the penalty of a single cache miss is large, 100 clock cycles. So even though the number of cache misses is small, 2% or 4%, the effect of that can be fairly large. You actually have a two and a half times slowdown of the entire system just because of 2% of the instructions being missed. In addition to whatever we have discussed so far, we typically also create a memory in some kind of a hierarchy. Usually what is these hierarchy levels are labeled L1, L2, L3, and so on. And as you might expect, L1 is the smallest, but also the fastest. So why is it the smallest and the fastest? Because the fastest is usually also expensive and you cannot afford to have a very large L1 cache. L2 caches are typically a bit larger than L1, but possibly slower. L3 is still larger, still slower and so on. These three levels are commonly found in all processors. There could be other levels depending on the type of processor or the type of system that you are building. But after all, this is not limited only to processors. What happens if I had more than one processor in the system? Now it brings in a whole new set of research and engineering optimization problems, primarily revolving around the area of what is called cache coherency. The simple way to state the problem is, what happens if CPU A writes to a cache and then CPU B tries to read from the same memory location? Should CPU B get the data from the main memory? Should it get it from its own cache? or should it get it from CPU A's cache? The answer in this case, of course, is that it should get it from CPU A's cache, but this can get quite tricky when two programs or two processors are trying to operate on similar or related data. How this gets implemented in hardware without leading to performance degradation is quite a challenging task. And finally, in addition to all of this, we can also have so-called shared caches, meaning that multiple processors in a system might also share some of the cache structure itself. Because after all, it may be that by having a large cache, but sharing it among many processors, we might be able to get a better engineering trade-off in terms of the capacity of the cache versus how well it is utilized. This last slide is an example of running the command ls cpu on a Linux machine. This is something I ran on the laptop I used for preparing these notes. As you can see, 
it has an x86 64 architecture which basically means a 64 bit variant of the x86 intel x86 architecture and the cpu has two operating modes it could operate either in 32 bit mode or in 64 bit mode the address sizes 39 bits of physical address and 48 bits of virtual address now this virtual address is something that we will look at in another video but the interesting thing to note over here is it actually has even though a 64 bit bus strictly speaking the address range that it can access is only 39 bits of physical memory of course this is already several gigabytes it's not a severe limitation therefore we accept this and especially in the use case of something like a laptop which is unlikely to have several hundreds of gigabytes of ram this is a perfectly reasonable optimization what you can see over here is it lists the number of cpus as eight but this is actually interesting because what it says is the number of cores per socket is actually only four in other words there are actually only four physical processors inside this system it uses something called hyper threading in order to implement a concept of two threads per core the idea of having two threads per core is that without having two separate alu units we might be able to make use of some of the sharing of the registers and various other parts of the core to give the impression that we effectively have two threads running on the core at the same time this is one way by which the designers of cpus have tried to improve the utilization efficiency try and have two separate threads so that two programs that are unrelated could be running using the same processor core what happens in such a situation is that let's say one of the programs is stuck waiting for data to come in from some cache uh, come into the cache from somewhere the other thread could be performing some kind of computations there are possibilities under which you could actually get better performance than what you would have assuming only a single thread per core but there are situations where this could actually end up not being beneficial as well and there are in fact certain kinds of server configurations where you might find that the hyper threading is explicitly turned off because it can lead to less predictable behavior than what you would like a few other things to observe over here apart from of course the fact that the maximum megahertz in this case is up to four gigahertz the bogo mips is an interesting number it's just something that is determined by the linux kernel itself when it starts up which is related to the clock frequency and ultimately gives a measure of how many instructions per second or how many millions of instructions per second this processor can execute but in some cases may also not directly correlate with the clock frequency it is supposed to be some kind of a vendor neutral way of measuring how many instructions a given processor can execute but it's mostly interesting because it has a funny name now what about the cache structure itself l1d cache is the data cache of 128 kilobytes l1i is the instruction cache so as you can see over here 128 kilobytes are used just for storing the, for caching instructions and another 128 kilobytes are used for caching data but this is l1 it is the fastest and as you can see at the bottom over here it is eight way set associative we would of course have liked it to be fully associative but that's difficult to do eight ways set associative is not bad the l2 cache is larger it is per core once again and goes up to one megabyte it is only four way set associative but on the other hand the capacity is larger which means that there's a good chance that even if you miss something in l1 that data is present in l2 l3 is even larger but on the other hand is actually shared in other words the eight megabytes that we have over there is actually shared among all the four physical cores that are present in the system this is one way by which we can provide a relatively large cache memory and at the same time make sure that the cost does not go out of control because after all it can be shared among multiple processors so overall to summarize cache memory is a important part of modern processors simply because we have many different memory technologies and it is difficult to get 
very high performance under all situations. How exactly we construct the different kinds of caches, the hierarchies of caches, the tunings of caches, how does it interact with software, what are the things that we can do to control it from the hardware and so on, are even today topics of research. There are many different variants that can be tried out for this. All that we are going to do as far as this course is concerned is just this high level overview. As I said, there's a lot more that you can read about if you're interested in these topics.